morning. Welcome to Brentwood Baptist Church. We know that you have a lot of options on any given Sunday morning, and on behalf of this congregation, let me tell you how glad we are that you have chosen to be with us. You have honored us with your presence. Now, I know that there are some experts who say, listen, half of success is just showing up. But you want more than that. You want more than just to show up, don't you? And we want more than that for you. And that's why this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we're having a mission and vision class. It's a great chance for one, you to know more about who we are as a church. Two, to find out where we're going as a congregation. And probably most importantly, for you to be able to find a place for you to connect your talents and your gifts and your passions in a way that makes a difference not only in our church, but in the kingdom of God. That's why this Mission and Vision class is so important, and that's why more than anything else, if you're a new member, we want you to be part of it. If you're thinking about membership, we want you to be part of it. And it's this Wednesday night, 6 o'clock in Wilson Hall. That's this Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, Wilson Hall, Mission and Vision class. And I look forward to seeing you there. I would love to serve others in some way, but my schedule is so crazy. I don't think I can commit to anything like that. I would love to go and help, but leaving home isn't an option right now. The Nurture Team at Brentwood Baptist and the Church at Station Hill offer many opportunities to serve others from your own home or on your own schedule. But even though you cannot attend the meetings, you can do this from your home. You can bring the items that we need for the children's home and leave them at Helen's desk. We have a food team that cooks for people. And most of these members just cook a meal and deliver them to the people that are in need. Whether delivering baskets, praying for others, writing cards, or preparing meals for families, there are many ways to serve, no matter your circumstance. One of the things I really enjoy about delivering baskets is just feeling like you're putting a smile on someone's face that day and maybe making their stay in the hospital just a little easier. The Nurture Team, connecting families to Jesus Christ by helping during times of illness, crisis, emergency, and adjustment. Learn more at brentwoodbaptist.com slash nurture team. Mentor relationships are one of the five ways we move forward to a Christ-centered life. Mentor relationships offer you a personal guide who's been where you are and can help you get to where you want to be in your spiritual walk. There are different kinds of mentor relationships, each designed to fit your specific needs with trained and qualified individuals ready to walk with you one-on-one. -on -one. Learn more about mentor relationships today on our website or come see us after the service right outside the worship center and take your next step in moving forward to a Christ-centered life. Hi, I'm Steve Layton, the Discipleship Minister. I have the privilege of leading a team of ministers to help people move toward a Christ-centered life. Welcome to worship at Brentwood Baptist. If you're a first-time guest, we would love to have a record of your visit with us by filling out a communication card. These are in the pew racks in front of you or in the bulletin if you're worshiping in Hudson Hall. And remember, anyone can use this card to update contact information or submit a prayer request so we can be praying just for you. Just drop the card in the offering a little later. Thanks again for joining us. And now, let's worship together. Well, good morning, church family. We're so glad that you chose to worship here at Brentwood with us this morning. Um, as most of you guys may know, uh, this week uh, was Vacation Bible School with our children's ministry. And so uh, we're going to play a few songs that these kids have been learning uh, all throughout the week. Thank you. 
these kids have been learning this week. Uh, we've had a theme, and uh, we've had a theme verse this week that the kids all throughout the week have been uh, memorizing and learning, and we even uh, have some motions for it. So if you guys would all stand up, and we're uh, going to read this passage together. First Peter 3.15, but honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you.
day that we can come here to this place and just worship you. And uh, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunities this week that, that all these workers and volunteers had to, to show these kids what a Christ-like life is and, and what it means to follow a God like you. And uh, we pray for all the kids that have just asked those questions this week and, uh, and just wondered what it is. Um, to just come into faith uh, in you, Lord. Uh, we love you so much for that. And it's your name we pray. Amen. This week at VBS, our, our mission was to answer the mo- one of the most important questions that anyone can ever ask. Who is Jesus? And so we went to God's Word to find all the answers for that. And And so we examined the eyewitness testimony of John the Baptist, and we looked at the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We examined the miracles, and at the end of the week, we knew for certain what the answer was, and the answer is, Jesus is Lord. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Messiah. I had the opportunity to counsel with with a young boy on Thursday morning, and he had just had one question. His question was, did Jesus really do all that? And I said, do what? He said, did he, did he really feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish? And I said, yeah. Did he really calm the storm and did he really walk on water? And I said, yeah. He said, did God really raise Jesus from the dead? And I said, he sure did. And his response was, wow. It was really neat. Isn't it amazing, though, and comforting to know that this same Lord who did all that is the same Lord that we can approach in prayer at a time just like this. We're about to enter into a time that we call our prayer and altar time, and it's a time for us to to focus our hearts on the Lord and to come to Him in prayer because He wants to hear our prayers. And many of you have the opportunity now, all of us have the opportunity now to pray. And so this altar here will be open if you want to come and, and kneel down here to pray. Our pastor will be kneeling here and you may feel compelled to come and, and pray over him as he preaches the word of God this morning. He values your prayers. You may just want to stay right where you are and that's okay too. But now is our time that we can go and enter into his presence as we pray to the Lord. So let's pray together. know that this world offers a lot of things, but we also know that there's nothing in this world compares to knowing you. And Lord, I pray that we would understand that even anew today. Lord, many of us have come here in this place this morning with all sorts of burdens and all sorts of things that we're dealing with that are just really, really hard. But Lord, we know that you are a powerful God. If you created the mountains and the valleys and everything in between, surely, Lord, you can meet our deepest need. And so, Lord, I pray that today as we 
join our hearts together in worship and glorify your name in this place as we sing the song, these songs, as we hear the word of God proclaimed. Lord, may you do a work in our own lives, in our own hearts. May we be transformed people, different than the people that came into this place, so we would leave, Lord, transformed. Lord, we thank you for VBS and the week we had last week and all the decisions that were made and all the volunteers that gave of their time and all the kids that you brought. Lord, we know that none of it was by accident, that it was all for a purpose. And Lord, we pray that the work that was done last week would go beyond this place and would go into the communities and families and all over Middle Tennessee to make a life-changing difference for the sake of Christ. And the families would be transformed by you. And so, God, we just give this time to you today. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor and the word that he will proclaim today to us from the word of God. We pray, Lord, that we would be have open hearts and attentive to what you have to tell us. And we pray this in the strong name of our son, your son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you have gotten just a short glimpse of the joyful chaos that, that we call Vacation Bible School. You know, it's one of the most important weeks of our year because of the outreach that happens. Not only do we have the opportunity to spend a lot of time with children, we get to meet families. And for some of these families, for instance, you just moved to the area. And one of the ways to get to know people is you come and you're part of a vacation Bible school. And we'll meet a lot of different people as they come into uh, to our church for the very, very first time. Uh, it's one of the most effective outreach things that we do all year. Uh, we had, uh, with attendants and leaders and all of that, we had over 2,000 people in, in this building every day. Uh, so it was a very successful that way. We have 31 professions of faith that we know about right now. And... Um, and I hesitate, hesitate to give you that number because one of the things that happens at a vacation Bible school is lots and lots of conversations. So that we'll have a lot more of that, but, but that's the number that we know about right now. If you were part of vacation Bible school this week, if you taught, if you attended, would you just stand just for a minute and let us say thanks, even in Hudson Hall. Thank you so much. It happened because of your faithfulness to this moment, uh, because um, you have responded to God's generosity to you in giving. We had the resources we needed to uh, engage these children, to provide them the resources they needed to have a good week. Uh, your faithfulness to this moment allowed us to respond to all the opportunities and challenges of Vacation Bible School, and we're grateful for that. And we're going to continue to do that. We had a team, we have teams uh, that lead Vacation Bible School in, uh, in Israel and, and in South Africa and Rio de you know, just ever, all over the world. We take the same concept and do it over and over again, and we're able to do that because of your faithfulness right now. So if you're in Hudson Hall, you'll see the blue buckets there on the table, and if you're in the bleachers, you'll see them at the end of the rows there. It would help us by getting those buckets started. We'd appreciate it. In the main sanctuary, of course, the, the, uh, the ushers will be coming, and we will receive your offering now. So let's continue to worship as we continue to give. Lord Jesus, receive the gifts of your children. Receive them because they're given by grateful children. All we are and all we have comes from you. So we pray, Father, that you would receive our tithe, receive our offerings, so there's not a man, not a woman, and not a child that doesn't know of your goodness. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church family. It has been an incredible week here with so many children and families um, coming to learn about Jesus and and today we are able to celebrate um, new life in Christ. And I want to introduce you uh, to this young lady. This is Joy Pritchard, and she is the daughter of Anita and Skip. And Joy is 17, and she will be a senior in high school this fall. And it, Joy has just a really neat story. She, she knows that the Lord saved her at a very young age as a child. And uh, they were, her family was living in another state at that time. And then when she, the summer before her fifth grade year, 
they moved here to Brentwood. And what Mike was just talking about, how Vacation Bible School is often a connecting point for families, especially when they move to the area and they are looking for something to do in the summer, that's what happened with Joy. Her family was new here, and so she came as a fifth grader to attend Vacation Bible School. And it was during that time of being in that fifth grade class that week that she met friends for the first time in this area and really started to get connected to the church. And some of those friends she met that week during VBS are here today to celebrate with her and they've remained friends all these years. And so Joy has been just growing and maturing her walk with the Lord over the years. Um, Her family actually moved just last year to Ohio. And Joy began to sense though that the Lord was calling her to publicly express her relationship with the Lord through baptism. And when she knew she needed to do that, she sensed that she needed to come back to Brentwood Baptist to do that because this was the family and the church body where she had grown up in and that she had just had so much spiritual development and she wanted to share that with you all today. And so today she's coming declaring that she belongs to Jesus and that she's been following him and she's intending to follow him the rest of her life. Is that true, Joy? Is that your testimony that Jesus Christ has saved you and that he is the Lord and the Savior of your life? Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Well, Joy, based upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you as my sister in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ and raised to walk in a new life. For a lot of us, the book of Philippians is our favorite book. Uh, A lot of us who have a life verse will have found it in the book of Philippians. Uh, Things like, um, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Uh, A lot of very familiar verses, a lot of quoted verses come out of this letter of uh, of Paul to the church of Philippi. Uh, A lot of us love this letter because it is so enthusiastic. Uh, Paul is just overflowing with joy. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. I'm so happy I just have to tell you twice, Paul says. We're so taken by that that we forget that the book was written in prison. Uh, Paul is not at his desk at a nice office. He's not in a library. He's not uh, uh, holding a position of, uh, of a professorship at some uh, academic institution. He is in jail. And it's not a minimum security thing where, you know, he can go out and walk and, and maybe catch the television or something like that or a library to work in. He is in the dungeon, the basement of a fort or a castle uh, somewhere in, in, we we believe, Caesarea. And he is chained to the wall or he is chained to a soldier. Uh, All of his needs are met not by the Roman government, but by friends who bring him food and who bring him something to to write on. All All that kind of stuff is taken care of by friends. And yet he's writing something, a letter, uh, overflowing with joy. And and when you read the letter and you understand the circumstances, your first response is, well, the old boy's finally slipped off the edge. Really, the pressure of of being an evangelist, the pressure of being a missionary in a hostile environment like the Roman Empire, he tells us on a couple of occasions what he has been through, all the beatings, all the the imprisonments, all this uh, that he had to endure. So maybe he's just kind of slipped a cog. You know, it, it happens. Uh, Maybe he just kind of disconnected from reality and kind of went to his happy place. Or, or, Paul knows something that we don't. He knows something so important, so valuable, that the knowing of it makes the situation, circumstances of your life trivia. I've learned in every situation to be content. What in the world was it that Paul knew? Well, it gives us a clue. 
the second chapter of this letter. Philippians chapter 2, we'll begin reading with verse 5. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. Make your own attitude the same as Christ Jesus, who in existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking a likeness, taking on the likeness of men. And he, when he had come as a man in his eternal form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee would bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Change our minds. Change our hearts. Change us. So that what we think, what we desire, who we are, is directly in line with what you think what you desire and who you are. And we pray this in your name. Amen. A, a lot of Paul's letters are written in kind of a, um, a conversation. Uh, the church has written a letter. The church has expressed an issue, a, a question about an issue. And so Paul writes theology back. And he'll say, uh, here is the question. Here's what the, the, the life of Jesus means. Here's what his resurrection means for us, and now here's how you are to live. There's always a therefore, there are all, uh, a verse. Uh, now, because of what I've been teaching you, now therefore live this way. Uh, we know some about the church in Philippi. Uh, we know it from the book of Acts. Of course, you know the story of the Philippian jail where uh, Paul and Silas were worshiping, and, and God answered their prayers, heard their worship, and sent an earthquake that blew the, jo the doors of the jail open. The Philippian jailer threatened suicide because he thinks everybody has escaped. Paul finds him and says, no, we're all here. The Philippian jailer is saved. His entire family is converted. And we have the beginnings of the new church in Philippi. It's not a strong church, vital church, as you and I would, would measure church success. But it's a very vital congregation, a very compassionate congregation, a very generous congregation, so much so that Paul uses this church as the standard of giving in letters to the other churches. Uh, he writes to the Corinthians, I want to tell you what your friends in Macedonia have done. Um, this church was, was not um, made up of strong, wealthy people. The, all these folks were struggling, and yet Paul is very uh, aware of the sacrifices they have made for him and the gospel, the growth they've had, and he's celebrating that. So he writes back this incredible letter of encouragement of, listen, uh, you're doing great. I want you to continue to do well. Now, how do you do that? And Paul does what a lot of preachers do when they're trying to find words to express some uh, particular meaningful thought. He quotes a hymn. How many of you have been in a, a religious service and heard the pastor say, it's like the old song says? That's exactly what Paul is doing here. Uh, you should have the same mind. And you can almost hear him now. Everybody sing together. Because we think this is one of the earliest Christian hymns uh, and some think that it was sung at, uh, at, at, the, at the Lord's Supper. And if you were in theology class with me at Southern Seminary and you had a particular teacher of theology, we would stop right now. You would stand and sing this hymn to whatever hymn tune he had chosen, and you would have to sing it in the original Greek just to kind of get a feel for it. We don't know what in the world we had a feel for singing it in the original Greek, but the professor seemed to enjoy the moment, and that was all that mattered right then. <laughs> 
So he quotes a song. Now, what's the song? Paul says, listen, here's how the song goes, and I want you to understand it. You should have the same attitude. Uh, the word attitude is kind of a soft translation there. It, it, it's more of a verb, more of a hard verb. You should have the same thinking. You should be thinking the same way. And it's an active control of the mind. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. Now, that last one, loving the Lord with your mind, is not something Baptists have done particularly well. Uh, we wanted heartfelt religion, and we wanted intense emotional experiences, and that's, that's where a lot of our emphasis is on. Did, did you feel it? And, and we had pastors who celebrated they didn't know anything. And they would stand up and say, I, you know, I, I don't have any training, schooling, I don't know anything. And I'd be out there going, then why do I have to sit here the whole time? You don't know anything. <laughs> what they were saying was, uh, the experience I know in my heart. Well, emotions are great. Uh, but if you're not careful, the emotions can lead you into a difficult situation. You have to have correct thinking. You have to have the truth. Sometimes it's not what you think, or sometimes it's not what you feel. It's what the truth is. And if you just go by feelings, you can get messed up. So Paul says, I want you to have this mind. I want, you to, I want you to be thinking this way. This is the way I want you to think. Now, look at what he does. I want you to have the same thinking of Jesus, who being equal with God, didn't think it was something to be grasped, something to be used for his own uh, satisfaction or his own pleasure. Paul wants you and I to understand, as believers, all of the promises, that's what he says in 2 Corinthians, all of the promises of God are yes in Christ. You are an heir to the kingdom of God. Everything that Jesus promised is already yours. You are rich beyond all knowing. You already have it. Uh, you are a child of the kingdom of God. But because you have this freedom, because you have this great gift, it's not something to use for your own um, ego, for your own satisfaction, for your own pleasure. It's not something to be grasped. Now, our world says you have to grab it. Our world says it is out there, and if you want it, you have to go get it. And you have to grab it, and you have to hold on to it, and you have to snarl at anybody who wants to come and take what is yours. It's a jungle out there, Mike, and this is the way that you have to do it. This is the real world. Jesus says, in the kingdom of God, you don't get kingdom success by grabbing, but by letting go. It is in giving that you receive, in dying that you live. This is the truth, the reality of the kingdom of God. Paul says, I want you to change your mind. Now, rather, rather, you know, most time when, when we hear that phrase, change your mind, somebody's been given new information. I thought one and one was two, was three. Now somebody has explained to me that one and one is two. I have changed my mind. I have new information, so I have a new conclusion. Paul is not saying change your mind as in come to a different conclusion he's in he's saying change your mind as in find something else to think with because the mind of the world is not going to get you kingdom success the way of thinking that the world tells you to do is not going to lead you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to have a brand new mind to think brand new ways. It's what Paul is talking about in the 12th chapter of Romans. Now, I, I told you just a minute ago that all of his theology, most of the time you have a great teaching of theology, they don't have a therefore verse. Well, in Romans, there is a ton of theology, and it, it, it goes on for 11 chapters, and we've talked about this before. Chapter 12 is the therefore verse. Listen, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Now, do not be conformed to this age, but transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what the good and pleasing and perfect will of God is. Do not be conformed to this world, but be, but be transformed. That word tra that we translate transform is not found outside of Christian literature. Do you know that it's, it's, it's a word unique 
to the Christian experience. Why? Because the experience of being transformed in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't find that anywhere else. Okay? Now, you know, I know that the world tells us that all the religions are the same. They don't know Christ, they don't know Christianity, and they certainly don't know the other religions. Uh, somebody that says that is just lazy. And here's some of the uniqueness of, of Christianity is in this hymn. Jesus understood that grabbing the glory that was rightfully his, it was his right as the Son, as one of the, as one of the persons of the Trinity. It was his. But he knew the heart of the Father, and the Father's heart was for lost humanity. So Christ goes to seek lost humanity. He humbles himself and comes in the form of a human being as a baby. You ever wonder why he came as a baby? What if he comes as a king? What's your first reaction to a king is to step back. What if he comes as a priest, a holy man? What's your first reaction? Step back. But he comes as a baby. What's your first reaction? <gasps> Let me see. Perfect strangers want to hold your baby. They do. Let me see. What beautiful thing to get right in your baby's face. This is, what kind of God does this? What kind of God comes to the world as a baby? What kind of God is so small that he will let a human being hold him? Humiliation. This God who will let us hold him. This God who will walk in our world, eat our food, share our sorrows, Die our death. Not only die death, but die the worst death imaginable. So there's never an occasion where you can go to Jesus and say, you don't understand. He understands. He knows. Because he was faithful like this, because he lived out the heart of the Father and sought lost humanity, he was exalted. Jesus knew the heart of the Father was to come and find the lost. I tell you this story often. I'll repeat it quickly. Have you ever been lost? I mean, really lost? Lost, lost, not know where you are, not know how you got there, not know how to get back, not know how to get to where you're supposed to go. So you call your friend, the one you were supposed to meet, and you say, I'm lost. What does your friend say? Where are you? If I knew that, I wouldn't be lost. Then your friend will ask you, well, what's around you? Well, there's a store, there's this intersection, I'm on this street. And the friend will say, I know where you are. I'll come to you. The good news of Christianity is not that you can get to God. The good news of Christianity is that God and Jesus Christ has come to you. So in that awful moment when you realize that your life is broken and you can't fix it, when you realize that you can't undo what you have done, when you realize that this is mess you can't do anything with, and you cry out to Christ to come help you, to come save you, his first response is, stay right where you are. I'm already there. The good news of Jesus Christ is that he finds us where we are. He loves us where we are. The best news is, praise God, he doesn't leave us there. What good is it to be found if you're not brought home? Can you imagine the rescue team? Uh, this is Hilo 1. We have found the lost party. We're coming home. No, not the party. We know where they are, though. <laughs> but what does that do? No. Jesus is the only one to come from the Father. He's the only one who knows the way back and can walk you home. This God who comes to us, this God who finds us, this God who has forgiven our failures, our sins, and welcomes us home 
and the love of the Father. That is the name that is exalted above every name. And that is the way that you are to think. You have your mind changed. Now, Paul did this all the time. I mean, this wasn't just the letter to the Philippians. We just didn't catch him in a good mood. Uh, he was standing in front of King Agrippa. He is on trial for his life. Agrippa gives him permission to speak. And he says, I was on my way to Damascus. He preaches a sermon. He tells his testimony and preaches a sermon. He doesn't say I've been wrongfully accused. He doesn't say my enemies are after me. He doesn't say I'm going to sue everybody. He says, listen to the story I have to tell you. And at the end of the sermon, he says this, I wish you, O king, and all men were just like me. And Agrippa says, you've lost your mind. Why would I, king, want to be with you? Because Paul understood the story that Jesus told about the parable of the merchant and the pearl of great price. I'm not sure most of us have spent enough time with this passage to really understand what it means. Jesus says there was a merchant who went all over the world looking for treasures and exquisite things, and he found a pearl of unmentionable worth, and he sold everything. He sold his house. He sold his cars. He sold his 401. He got rid of everything. He has nothing cashed everything in to buy that pearl. They place it in a little leather pouch and he keeps it tight in his pocket and his hand over it. He knows he has the pearl of great price. He is rich beyond anybody's knowing, but you can't tell it. So you'll see him downtown and he'll be wearing the same thing he wore yesterday. Why? He sold everything else. You see him at the same place, same time. Why? He doesn't have a home to go to. And he doesn't have a way to get there if he did have a home to go to. You're seeing everything he owns right in front of you. But you don't know everything he has. So you feel sorry for the friend. And you walk up and you hand him a $10 bill. And you say, go buy you some lunch. And his eyes look at you and they begin to dance and sparkle and he laughs out loud at you. You're going to buy me lunch? I can buy everything here that's downtown. I have, I, I have everything that I need. I am rich beyond all telling. You don't know all that I have. So the world looks at you and say, you have nothing. And we say to the world, you don't know all that we have. I, I know, you hear a sermon like this, you're going to pull me aside and go, Mike, boy, that's a great sermon. Well, there's some phrases in there I want to cross-stitch and put on my refrigerator door. They're just really motivating. And a couple of times I had tears in my eyes, but listen. What you're talking about will not work. This pouring yourself out won't cut it. Uh, you can't get anywhere by being nice to everybody. You can't get anywhere by giving everything away. It won't work. Okay, let me, let me respond with one question. And your way is? You get the front page of the Tennessee and you flip open the paper. How long do you have to read before you scream out loud? This world is sick. This world is messed up. We have gotten things so the world stopped this week. Shut down because we didn't know what team LeBron was going to play on. <laughs> they broke in the newscast. LeBron's going to Cleveland. Oh, good. That's... We've got a war in the Middle East. We've got chaos on the southern border. Who knows what's going on with the economy? But LeBron's in Cleveland. <laughs> yes. 
Now we've got to find out where all the other free agents were going to go. And, of course, we have the World Cup soccer. The last game is today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Germany beat Brazil 7-1. I was so grateful Germany scored a touchdown. Really? They break in, become some celebrity, has been arrested. Are you kidding me? This is success. This is what we are dying to have. No thanks. No thanks. The world's way isn't working. And the good news is that Jesus doesn't bring us new information. He brings us an entire new reality. The kingdom of God. A new reality. And you need to start thinking. Get your mind in the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world. Out of darkness into light. Paul ends the book of Philippians with this beautiful, beautiful encouragement to think on things that are beautiful, righteous. These are noble. These are the things that you think about. Now, how do you do that? Right? I mean, isn't it just great to just walk out of here with all these great platitudes? I'm going to think like Jesus. How are you going to do that? You're going to do it by some simple practices. One, you're going to open up the scriptures and you're going to read. The Psalms are the prayer book of the Bible. Start there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us who Jesus was, what he did, and what he taught. The, book, the letters tell us what it means. Okay, I don't care if you read one word a day, start. How many times do you have the privilege to open up a book in the presence of the author? And say, what did you mean here? This was a beautiful scene. Tell me what this means. How did you think about this? One of the great things, one of the great honors we have of being an image, of um, uh, the bearer of the image of God, is that God has given us the right to wrestle with it. Like Jacob, what do you mean? How did you get this? This doesn't make any sense. How can I do that? You say that if somebody slaps me on the right cheek, I'm supposed to turn the left cheek. Is that before or after I slap him back? <laughs> say, I want to know. See, the, the, the term we have for Jesus is rabbi, teacher. And he promises you, if you will open the book, I'll meet you there. And not only will you learn the words on the page, Jesus says, I'll put them in your heart because it will change what you want and it'll change your desires. I'll put them in your mind and it'll change the way you think. Because once you know that who you are and what you have is secure in Christ, nobody can take that away from you. Then you're free, free to serve however Christ asks you to serve. For instance, he will introduce you to somebody who doesn't know him yet. And it will be your privilege to be this person's friend for the sake of Christ. And this person will have a hard time getting their life together. Uh, they'll be making bad decisions. That You'll have to deal with some consequences. And, and it will be inconvenient. Sometimes it'll be hard. And your friends will say, why are you putting up with that? Why are you doing that? Why are you suffering like that? Why are you putting yourself through all that pain? But you won't be aware of it. You'll only be aware of how much you love your friend and how much you're praying for your friend to get it together, to know who they are in Christ and find their way home. You will have emptied yourself, humbled yourself. You'll be thinking just like Jesus. He gives us not 
only new information, but an entirely new reality that not only changes your mind, it changes all of you. This new reality of the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Perhaps for some of you, this is the first decision, the first choice about a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have realized that you are successful in a lot of ways. You have a lot of things, but you have nothing. The only thing you know is that what is broken in your life, you cannot fix. What have you done, you cannot undo. It begins there by realizing that what has happened in your life you cannot fix. But it goes on by believing that Jesus died for those sins, those mistakes, those failures, that he paid the price for that. And that in his resurrection and by confessing him to be Lord of your life, you are invited to a kingdom life, a life that you didn't even know was possible. And it's yours, it's his gift to you. He's waiting for you where you are. The church will wait for you as you come. But I beg you, don't hesitate. Don't leave with this decision unmade. Our friends, our ministers, our counselors are waiting for you in the parlor. It's in an open, comfortable room just across from the sanctuary. And we'd, we'd love to have the chance to talk with you, answer you questions, pray with you, so you can know this reality in your own life today. Perhaps it's to become a member of Brentwood Baptist Church, and we'd love for you to get that process started. Or maybe you just need somebody to pray with you. However the Lord has come to you, he's waiting for you where you are. The church now waits for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open, every heart. We pray that the choices we make now are exactly, exactly what you want. We pray this in your name. If you guys would stand up, we're going to sing a couple more choruses of Jesus Messiah together. So sing this out to him this morning. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, home blessing redeemer. for sinners the ransom from heaven Jesus Messiah oh the Lord of all Jesus Messiah Once again, thank you guys so much for coming today and joining us in worship. You guys are dismissed.